Good morning. How are you today? This is Gail Christian. I'm sitting in for Angie Harvey, and you're looking at your women's circle. And uh, it's Black History Month, and we're going to talk about that for a moment. And we've got two great guests this morning. The comic, Suzanne Westenhofer, is going to be here talking about comedy. And we've also got Kate Ullman, who's going to talk to you about what to do with the stuff you don't know what to do about that stuff. So, as you know, February is Black History Month, and it's going to be all month once again. But I did want to raise an issue with you, and actually... I think I'd like you to respond and we can talk about some of your responses next week. And it has to do with this whole politically correct language issue. Now, I think that language is very important. What comes out of your mouth goes into the air and it shapes your society and it shapes the thoughts of your citizens. And what people say is exactly what they often think. And what they say often influences what other people think. So it's very important that the language be monitored and that you don't have a language that poisons your society. Your language should be safe. And I think that there should be a penalty for you poisoning the language. And I think that when you are in the workplace or in any public position, whether you're making a speech, writing an editorial, posting on the internet, uh, talking to the school board, uh, out in public intimidating other people, telling lies and saying things that are derogatory and degrading, then there is a price to pay for that. And I think that there should be a public reaction to that kind of conduct. And I think it's perfectly correct for people to be sued, fired, and anything probably short of flogged uh, for doing that because it doesn't make us strong, it makes us all weak. But I have another site I want to ask you about, and I want you to send me a, uh, an email, and we can talk about it some more next week, and you can send the email to info at yourwomencircle.com. And that is what is said in private. I tend to believe, and I'm not absolutely sure, and this is what I want you to respond to, I tend to believe that what you say in private has a different set of rules. If I'm in my home, my backyard, my car talking to my friends and I make derogatory hateful remarks I tell lies I say all sorts of things well I think I should get a pass I think I should get a pass because I'm not poisoning the public dialogue I'm at home and I'm talking to my friends and my friends have the right to react they can say I agree I don't disagree they can leave or we can all sit around and be hateful together but I think that perhaps I have the right to be hateful at home without a public backlash that results in my being fired from my job, humiliated, run out of town uh, on a rail. And I'd like you to respond to that because maybe there's something I'm missing and I certainly would like to see what you have to say about it. And the other point is that I'm very concerned about the hypocrites who do the punishment uh, because often the same people that fire you for uh, uh, for saying something publicly that is offensive and racist and derogatory, those same people often wouldn't hire a woman and pay her an equal wage. They wouldn't hire a black and pay them anything. Uh, and here's their way of showing that they are addressing racism and inequality in America. Well, it's really easy to you know walk around uh, persecuting people who are obnoxious and hateful. It's a lot harder to give somebody a job, give them a bank loan, give them a break, and uh, give them a decent place to stay. I'd like to hear what you have to say about that. We'll talk about it more uh, next week. This program is brought to you by yourwomencircle.com. It's a business organization for lesbians who exchange resources and ideas, and it's a wonderful place to join. Check out the website. We'd love to have you join us. This morning, we have someone that I'm very excited about as a guest. When I was a kid, I grew up in the early days of television. And that was a time when, when you turned on TV, comics ruled. Uh, your humor was brought to you by comedy. And I've always thought that comedy was the highest art form of entertainment and also the hardest. 
I mean, you can play the piano every night in a bar and nobody's going to boo you out of the place. I think comics are really the best and the toughest. And we have one of the best and the toughest with us today. Suzanne Westenhofer, thank you for joining us this morning. It's uh, so nice to see you. Uh, Suzanne, tell me, what was your earliest influence uh, in comedy? I mean, who did you like that made you think maybe you could do that too? Um, no, the, all the comics that I liked in the beginning uh, that I listened to, <laughs> I'm a child of the 70s. Um, I didn't know I wanted to be a comic then. I never even considered it. I thought I wanted to be a big Broadway star, a famous movie actor. And so the ones that probably really influenced me were George Carlin and Shelley Berman and all the guys that had the albums, Robert Klein. Um, the first comic that made me think I can do it because I was openly gay from the moment I knew I was gay. So that's 1981. And um, the first comic that let me say, oh, well, here's a, an open lesbian comic was Kate Clinton. Yes, and, absolutely. Yeah. One, one of the best. You know, I think that actually the first lesbian comic that was out, even though her uh, her material did not reflect that she was a lesbian, was probably Mom's Mabley. Have you heard that? Yes, yes. yes. I mean, she was able to, she wasn't able to acknowledge her lesbian, her lesbianism. That's right, that's right. But uh, there's a documentary where the uh, dancer, uh, uh, Miller, I can't think, uh, Norma Miller, who was a dancer who knew Moms Mabley, and the interviewer says to her, uh, uh, do, is Moms Mabley a lesbian? We heard that. And Norma says, I don't know if she was a lesbian or not, but we used to refer to her as Mr. Mom. So uh, I thought that was, a, that was a funny line. Apparently she was a notorious lesbian that drove around in a big convertible with a bunch of cute babes in the back. Uh, Suzanne, what's the difference between the drunk at the party who tells really funny jokes and someone's ability to really be a professional comic? Um, consistency. Uh, I would say consistency. A lot of people have been, they've been saying that to me forever. They go, I'm very funny at my office. I'm very funny at parties, whatever. Um, but that's not the same as doing it night after night, if show after show, um, with a different audience, an audience doesn't know you, an audience who may have stood in line or paid too much, making that entertaining those people night after night after night. That's a career. That's a job that takes talent and practice and commitment. You know, just having a few and getting up and making basically your friends or the people that you work with laugh. Lots of people can do that. Lots of extroverts can do that sort of a thing but it's not consistent in making your living at it. Am I making that clear? Does that seem no, clear? That, no, that's uh, uh, that's very clear. I heard something in an interview and I want you to tell me if I, if I heard it right. You said that you didn't prepare your material or you didn't write it down. You just got up and winged it. Am I overstretching here and saying that? Uh, you are not. Um, when I first heard stand up, which was July 31st, 1990, first time I was ever in a, a, a little club, a contest for new comics, I had a very prepared, memorized three minutes. And I did, and then as I, I won that little contest and was like, oh, I can do it, I can do it. And then I started doing all the other little open, what they called open mic uh, things in New York City. And I thought, and I don't know how I got this in my head, that I had to have a different three minutes every time. Like that I couldn't rerun anything. So I was doing that for months and uh, people were like, no, 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 you can, you know, have a set list and whatever. But by then I was starting to get booked where I was doing like 20 minute sets here and 20 minute sets there. And um, I would use a lot of the same material that I'd been using, but I, I never, planned it and it always went any way I wanted to. Like I might go, I really want to talk about my cats tonight. But then I would come out and say something. The audience would laugh about that. And I would forget about all the cat stuff because this became a more fun topic. So I have a, the audience really controls the show with me. Um, I don't have that. I want to tell this story and I'm telling this story no matter what. 
I let the, like if I start talking about something and the audience really responds to it, then I go. And it might be stuff I've never said before. It might be stuff I'll never say again. Um, uh, if I come out and start talking about my cats and the audience goes, uh, you know, then I'm like, no more cat stuff next. And I just so, sort of go that way. And I don't have like a memorized, prepared set or jokes. I have also, I'm not a joke teller as much as I'm a storyteller in my style. So, and the stories change every time I tell them, not because I lie about them. I mean, like you might make more of an emphasis on the car ride over to whatever happened with the story because that's funnier and the audience is responding to that. Uh, so it, it's not very planned. Since the audience can controls the controls what's going on, tell me briefly what was your best moment on stage and what was your worst? Uh, oh, I don't know if that's the fair thing. Um, so some of my best moments are like when I was able to, I got up and uh, maybe I was sick. I didn't feel well. Everything was bad. Um, and I was just going to try to cling to stories I'd told before and just kind of get through it. And, um, and this has happened to me a lot, especially I'm, I'm thinking of like places that, for whatever reason, Madison, Wisconsin and uh, different clubs that I've done. And then you come out there and you say something and the audience just throws this love and acceptance at you. And suddenly you're not sick anymore. You don't have a headache. And those are my best shows. And there's been a lot of them, but they're the ones I always think of. I'm trying to think if there was ever any like... I mean, there have been things like where I was making a joke about uh, KD Lang and Martina Navratilova. I was doing this whole thing about butch and femme in the lesbian community. And I was in New York City at this big event and I did this whole thing about, everybody argues about how there's no butch and femme in the lesbian community, but um, I just want you to do this picture, Martina Navratilova and KD Lang having sex. And everybody in the audience, gay and straight, boys and girls, everybody kind of went, <laughs> and I went, see, it's because they're both boys. They're both Yangs. They're both whatever term you want to use, right? And then after the show, they were both there. <laughs> and I, as I came off like stage and, and went into the little reception room and saw that they were there, I was like, <laughs> but they loved it. And they said, I was absolutely, absolutely right. They even like, stood next to each other and went, we would never have sex. We would never be together. And it was very cute. So you so you never had one of those Apollo moments where everyone starts booing and they come out and yank you off the stage. You know, I just was, it's funny you should say that. I just was talking about this yesterday. Um, you know, I'm getting older. I've been doing stand up for my career for 28 years. We had this whole year. This is the longest I've ever gone without doing a show. The end of this month is a full year without doing a show. I've never had anything like that. And I was talking to somebody about, I don't have a booking agent anymore. A lot of the cl clubs that I've done are closed. Wah, you know, and I thought, and I was whining and I go, and I did everything right. I wasn't mean to anybody. I didn't create any controversy. I didn't step on anybody to get ahead. Every show I did was good. I almost never bombed. I can't even think of a time I bombed. I honestly can't. And so I was like, why can't I get someone? You know, it was just, it was just me whining about like, why can't I get ahead or get someone who wants to book me? Um, because you can't, it's really hard to book yourself as a comic. Yeah. And Go on. It occurs to me that I have not, I don't have any, I don't even have a story of that time I failed or bombed so horribly. The worst I have is, um, I'd been doing stand up about a year. Um, so I wasn't making my living yet. And a gentleman uh, came into Manhattan and saw me. He said, I have a club up in, um, I want to say Yonkers, but he had this club. He said, I'd like you to come up and do uh, 20 minutes there and I'll give you 50 bucks, whatever. And it was such a big deal. One, one of my first paid gigs, but when I got there, it was um, some sort of nice sort of like banquety club room that people have. And, but the group, was um, an all black sort of uh, mid uh, mid 
30s, mid 40s, wealthy organization. And the comics getting up, I think there were seven comics to do like 10 minutes or 15 minutes, whatever it was, um, were all male. And it was like four black guys, two white guys, all straight. I mean, 1991, you know what I mean? So I was there, the only woman comic, the big lesbo, and I felt so white. I felt so white. And when I first got up, um, and I said, what I used to say back then, I said something like, oh, I guess I'll be your only lesbian comedian tonight <laughs> that you know of. <laughs> it was funny back then. It was funny. And when they realized I was not kidding, that I'm absolutely gay, the women in the audience <laughs> they were not having it. <laughs> I, the guys let it happen. They seemed open and they left. So within like 30 seconds, I was like, I have to win those women over. I have to. But I thought, what do I have in common with a middle-aged wealthy black woman you know, and I just couldn't think of anything like really that would get to them. So I started talking about sex. And I talked about how with lesbians, it also gets like boring and you have to think of new things. And just, I don't know, whatever. I just made them realize that sex between two partners is the same, whether it's boys or girls or whatever. After a while, there's like, you know, you got to make date nights and all that stuff. And they really started to relax and laugh so that by the time the show was over, a lot of them came up and got their picture taken with me. And that was back when we had pictures with a little. <laughs> and I was so thrilled that I had managed to get, you know, to get through. And a, a bunch of the women, uh, uh, women said to me, uh, you had a lot of, a lot of nerve coming up here, a little white girl. Little white lesbian, <laughs> and I said, well, "I didn't know. I didn't know. No one told me that this." Was <laughs> oh, that's funny. Speaking of being a white girl, do you think that ethnic comic co comics, because of their background of oppression, have an edge in comedy? I mean, I've always thought uh, that you want a really funny comic, they're either going to be Jewish or black. Do you think they have that edge? Because I'm, I'm going to say. If you I, they might have an edge, but I'm going to say if you're good, you're good. Yes, if you're good, I mean, you're good. It's not like uh, I'm friends with a famous uh, tennis player, a female tennis player. We're friends. And for years we talked about the thing that because she would always say, I admire so much what you do. And I'm like, you won Wimbledon nine times and things like this. Right. But um, she would say because she'd say. When I get up there, it doesn't matter what I look like. It doesn't matter anything, what color I am in. If I hit the ball faster and I get it past that other person, I get the point. There's no argument. But if you get up there and you do stand up and they decide for whatever reason, they just don't like the way you look or mm -hmm. they don't like something. She said that. And that's true for all comics. She said it's much harder to do something that you do. And because yeah. it's 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 subjective. Yes. You know, my last, right. My last question. Tell me something about the, you know, I'm having so much fun. I want 10 more questions. <laughs> Tell me something about the lesbian circuit. I mean, the, you know, blacks have historically the Chitlin circuit, uh, June mm -hmm. and the Borscht belt. Is there a lesbian comedy circuit and, and who's on it? Uh, there was a lesbian um, entertainment circuit, let's call it for years and years, pretty much from the seventies on where, and especially it was usually from like May to September, there were all these lesbian festivals across the country. Uh, they had lesbian performers, meaning lesbian musicians, lesbian, uh, whatever jugglers, I'm making that up of course. Uh, but, and they had speeches and, uh, things that you went to that were about being lesbian. Of course it was the eighties, the seventies, the nineties. Um, and I, a lot of, once I started doing stand up, I did a lot of those festivals and those kind of events. And it, it's really, it's pretty fun. Cause it's like, you're with your people. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I think it's, sadly, I think it's, it's pretty much dead now. Um, 
one of the things that happened, and uh, I used to worry about this, I'm not the only one, that once we got acceptance, we'd be, uh, com you know, gay comics, we'd be, you know, slid into the other comics. So far, so good. But slid into the other comics as a woman still puts you down a bunch of notches, sadly. So uh, the lesbian, the whole idea of like a lesbian circuit is sort of not happening. I've been talking actually with other lesbian comics. We've been talking about getting one of the big organizations like uh, like Olivia or HRC to start doing some big lesbian only events. I mean, doesn't not, they don't have to be expensive? It doesn't have to be a thing, you know. But because I, there are almost no lesbian bars in the United States. There's seriously, there's like three left in the United States. There's no lesbian festival. There's only one lesbian festival that happens anymore. There used to be like 80, 100 lesbian festivals. And all this erasure, whatever you want to call it, I think is bad for the new lesbies. And um, I don't want that to happen. I do a show on something called Women on the Net, which is like a, a channel that a lesbian is starting to try to have lesbian virtual entertainment since the pandemic. And I do a talk show once a month. Um, and one of my goals in that talk show is to like uh, introduce the next group of lesbians, should they be watching, to some of the, like, like when they hear lesbian music, do they know who Chris Williamson is? Have they ever heard of Meg Christian, you know, or um, Linda Tillery? There's just, there are too many, there's all these people and there's nothing left for them to learn all this stuff. Lesbians who are like 20 something right now, where are they going to go to learn about our our lesbian history, the, some of the stuff we came from? Because us, the early lesbians were amazing. We were doing stuff nobody was doing. We were already boycotting certain organizations because they didn't treat animals correctly or didn't treat their workers correctly, things like that. We've been ahead of the game in so many things. I, I, I hope there's some way that either I or some other lesbians can keep kind of, I don't know what, teach the new lesbians? Just make them want to know about our history, where we come from, the culture we had for a good 70 years, right? I'm thinking. That's a, that's a good thought. Before you go, Suzanne, can you tell me a lesbian joke? Hmm. Well, while you're thinking about it, can I tell you my favorite Mom's Mabelie joke? Yes. Okay. Uh, this is uh, mom's is uh, uh, said that she used to look at these uh, move these Disney movies. And one day she came in and she looked in the mirror and she said, mirror, mirror, uh, you know, uh, on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? And the mirror said, not you, bitch. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> mad at that mirror. <laughs> Suzanne Weston offer. Thank you so much for taking the time. Suzanne it was great being with you. Nice seeing you. Thank Very you. Nice Wonderful. You. I hope you stay safe and this is over soon. And when I see you, I will hug you. Full body hug. Oh, and I hope you get work soon. I hope all the comics, you know, get back on the circuit. Thank you. you, again. you don't want us out there just by <laughs> ourselves. <laughs> uh, uh, that was Suzanne Weston. It's wonderful talking to a comic. I'm always, uh, I'm always late in the show. I never know what time it is. I'm always looking, uh, looking around, but it, I hope that uh, we're still in the same day and I'm really dying for some water. Sonny, you think I could get some water? Thank you very much. Uh, this show is brought to you by your, Sonny's sticking stuff in my face. I don't know <laughs> what's going on here. She's trying to reset the camera. And now I just disappeared right from in front of your eyes. And then I got these kind of Martian green eyes. Are you checking this out? Uh, well, in any event, this show is brought to you by your Women's Circle, which is a wonderful organization for uh, lesbians. And uh, they get together. They exchange resources. They uh, chat each other up. Uh, it's it's good. Check it out. Uh, www.yourwomenscircle.com. Uh, in the wings is uh, someone I think is really wonderful, a personal friend, and someone who I think has a wonderful job. It's Kate Ullman. Hello, Kate. How are you, dear? Good morning. Good morning. I You're looking good. Really. 
<laughs> uh, Kate, Kate is a regular on the show. She's one of what we call our editors, and she joins us uh, every few shows to give you some advice on what to do with your stuff. What are you talking about this morning, Kate? Well, you know, in this time of COVID and being home, a lot of us cleaned out our closets. We've cleaned out the basement. We've cleaned out the garage, the bookcases, and what have you. And I know I have. Uh, there's a, still a lot of stuff, all those maybes that I put back, you know, and said, well, I'll deal with this down the road. But the one thing I noticed in my house that I have an abundance of that is really passe are my CDs. What about you, Gail? What about me? I have got boxes and boxes of CDs, but they're precious. At least I think they're precious. Uh, and how often do you play them? Never. I, I go to the radio, I go online and I, uh, you know, and every day I get up in the morning, I go to YouTube and open a day with Etta James. Oh, so I nice. I have to admit I don't play them. Yeah. yeah. So what should I do with them, Kate? Well, what I, I do with them is I send them off to Declutter and Declutter will pay for the postage. Now you may only get a quarter for that album or rather for that CD or you may get $5 for it. And you do this on an app on your phone and you make a list. It makes it automatically. You print it out. You put it in a box. You send it off. The postage is taken care of. And you get a check in the mail. Better than donation. You know, there are a couple of places to do this at. Um, you can also do it on eBay and, and a couple of other places to, to go to. But... I like declutter. They've been dependable and it's easy. It's like real easy. Okay, let, let me ask you this. Is there some way for me to determine if my CD is worth 25 cents or worth $5? Well, oh, excuse me. I have a slight cold. So yes, um, when you scan your CD, they actually come up with the price they're going to pay you right then and there. And oh, so oh that's good. That's good. So, yeah, so if, if it comes up $5, I go, hey, what do they know about my, my CD that I don't know? And then I may go online and, and try to research it if there's a better way to sell it and take that $5 and turn it into $25. Now, does this same thing apply, for instance, to uh, albums or to uh, uh, what was that other thing before we had CDs? We had those. Oh, Eight tracks. What, what, oh, yeah. And those other little tapes, what were those things called? Those um, little, they're little teeny tapes, you know. Yeah, yeah. All right. Does this same is this same place uh, apply? Yes, and they'll also buy your um, phones and and other electronic things. And and I don't say it's ideal. I don't want to misrepresent this. It's but it for me it's the ease of it, and and that's what I like. That's a uh, uh, that's that's good. Most people do have. CDs everywhere, and they don't know what to do with them. Uh, anything else? You got another good idea? Yes, I do. I know that a lot of us have uh, jewelry, jewelry that was passed down to us, that was, you know, grandma's, not gold, not the diamonds, just the costume jewelry. And I brought an example of that, Gail. A lot of us uh, have, um, you know, mom's favorite bling jewelry, something like this. It's hard to see with the light, but um, rhinestone jewelry. Now, rhinestone jewelry has different levels of quality. And often these rhinestone pieces are marked on the back with a name. And the best rhinestone jewelry of vintage quality was actually um, Eisenberg. And Eisenberg manufactured bling jewelry for dresses in the 30s and his jewelry sold so well that, that people said well forget the dress let's just have an Eisenberg pin and then under that comes Weiss W-E-I-S-S -S, or Kramer uh, Lisner they're a whole bunch so go into your jewelry box and look at the back of your jewelry and see if it has a name on it because that's known as signed jewelry. 
And if it has a name on it, it's more valuable than without. That's good. And, yeah. And yeah. it's desired, it's saleable. People still like it. I know the, the pin I just showed you, I take it out at Thanksgiving and I wear it right through the holidays every day. It's my special seasonal pin. I love it. Kate, thank you so much. Uh, uh, your segment is absolutely a, one of my favorites. Every time you come on, I've got an idea what to do with some of that stuff in the garage. Thank you for uh, joining us. That's Kate Allman. Uh, you, you can uh, reach Kate uh, or you can call the clutter or you can say, er, yeah, everything goes net. I'm fumbling around trying to see it. Uh, thank you. This is the end of our show today. This is Gail Christian. This is your Women's Circle uh, sponsored by uh, and paid for through the memberships through your Women's Circle. Sign up. We'll send you information. Uh, join and be a part of what we uh, are, are doing each week. Uh, thank you for attending. Next week, we've got another comic coming up. It's Karen Williams. It's going to be with Tori Osborne, an icon from the LGBTQ community. Thank you so much much and a happy uh, Black History Month. I hope it's happy for you anyway. Thank you again for joining us.